Live Journalism in D.C., Jennifer Steinauer. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jennifer Steinhauer, editor for Live Journalism for the New York Times here in Washington. It's my pleasure to welcome you and our online viewing audience to Times Talks DC, our live conversation series pairing New York Times journalists with the brightest and most innovative minds in politics and policy, film, art, business, technology, and this evening food. I want to give a special welcome to New York Times subscribers. Thank you for helping making our journalism happen. This is the first of six Times Talks in DC that we're going to do this year. We have more exciting programming in store for you, including a special appearance um, on February 15th but with Jennifer Lawrence, so watch details for that. Tonight, we are so delighted to be joined by three James Beard Foundation and Michelin Award-winning chefs and restaurateurs known for changing the dining scene here in Washington and beyond. They've also made significant humanitarian contributions, whether it's fighting hunger across America or galvanizing relief efforts across hurricane-torn Puerto Rico. Here to interview them is someone who knows our special guests and their world very well, our national food correspondent for the New York Times, herself a four-time James Beard Foundation Award winner for food writing, and a KC Mattel journalist for her work on childhood obesity. Please join me now in welcoming our moderator, Kim Severson, and our very special guests, Jose Andres, Danny Meyer, and Aaron Silverman. Gentlemen, I don't know, in this Me Too era, are you supposed to sit first or I am? I'm confused. Okay, never, I'll just sit I'm down. I'm going to wait for you in okay, case. Okay, just in case. So have a seat. There you go. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, thank you so much for coming. It's, um, it is a great uh, uh, feat to get these three guys on stage at the same time. Um, so thank you um, to the people who put this together. And uh, we have um, a massive Facebook audience watching from home in their jammies on their couch. Um, and there are some people here in your jammies too, so thank you for that. Um, anyway, we have a lot to talk about. There is a lot going on in the food world. Um, so we will uh, hit, hit all the big topics, I hope, and also talk a little bit about food itself. Um, I, I'm just going to start out with the... Uh, uh, you know, with the um, hashtag Me Too situation, um, it's been, I think, uh, revolutionary what's happening, uh, the discussion in restaurants about sexual harassment and um, the bro culture in kitchens, and uh, it feels like we are in quite a, um, you know, quite a moment uh, culturally. So this is a safe space. If there's anything you guys want to confess, right now would be a great time. You just got done telling us a massive Facebook audience. Yeah. So. <laughs> So, no. Hi, Facebook. Yeah. Um, Hi, Mark. Uh, but, but let's jump, jump right in. Right now, you know, I, I wrote a story that was in the Times today about how four different restaurant groups that had uh, people who had um, uh, scandals around sexual harassment and sexual abuse and um, how those restaurant groups are trying to recover from that. Um, and it, why don't we just, we'll start, Aaron, at the end. Has this uh, uh, sexual harassment issue changed how you do business? What have you done differently? Um, I mean, it's, it's besides stopping the harassment, but I'm, you know, that's, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I feel really fortunate because I grew up in um, a restaurant culture over the last 10 years, or at least the restaurants that I worked in, I was really fortunate to be in super positive environments that I, I think really set the example for what, what, what I wanted to do, what we wanted to do. Also, um, <laughs> reading your book was a big inspiration for a lot of how to do things right. Um, so I, I felt very fortunate that kind of when I started our company and our business and decided what I wanted our culture to be like, that uh, we decided, <laughs> it's stealing from you, but to put our, put our people first. And I mean, a big part of our, our uh, I mean, uh, literally our mission statement says that we want to be not the best restaurant, but the most enjoyable one to dine in and to work in. And I think if, if we want to be the most enjoyable restaurant to work in, aside from all the things that you need to do, it needs to be a really safe and kind of positive environment. And literally every day that, that um, I come in, or when my leaders and my managers and everybody comes in, we're, we're trying to do one of two things. And it's either, it's either make the guest lives better and make the staff lives better, staff lives better. And I mean, paramount to that is just having a really positive, in, in, uh, not just sexual harassment, any harassment, um, support, every, every possible way is just 
I mean, that's our goal every day is to make their lives better. Have you ever had somebody come to you and say that they are being sexually harassed or have you noticed, ever noticed, have you ever had a case you've had to deal with of abuse or harassment either from customers or? So we've never had anyone internally come in and uh, complain about harassment from another peer, but we have had that from guests before. Um, not sexual harassment, but you know, just some not nice verbal stuff. Do you just throw them out or? Uh, after they yeah. sign the well, after they sign the kind of card politely, slip. kind of not politely, yeah. but we ask them yeah. to leave and and not come yeah. back. So yeah. And Danny, you were at the Smithsonian today, right? And um, one of his original notebooks from Union Square Cafe was in the Smithsonian, which is like so from cool. From 1985. Right? Yeah. Um, and uh, we were talking backstage. You talked about sexual harassment a little bit in that, um, in that, uh, but it was in the context of protecting you. Talk, tell us a little bit about what your thoughts were back then about sexual harassment and what your lens on it is now. Well, it's exactly what, what I'm was. Maybe you're still against it, but yeah. <laughs> what so. was interesting about visiting that notebook? Uh, which I was telling Kim earlier that we didn't have computers in 1985, so I was a much better note taker back then than I am today. And my thoughts, uh, interestingly, have not evolved very much since that point. This is, what ha this is what has evolved. I think that restaurants have always been a place that have attracted a certain community of people who chose that as opposed to going into corporate life, let's say or becoming journalists or whatever. And there's a family, a journalist, but there, yeah. there's a family type camaraderie uh, that uh, combined with the adversity of having to get the place up and going every night at six, the mise en place, the guest book, the table sets. And, and you get through a hard night. And historically, waiters and waitresses and cooks go out afterwards and they drink. And that can create a, unfortunately, a ripe environment historically for exactly the situation that our industry is in right now. There's absolutely no question about it. And then you combine that with the industry when I first came up into it in the mid 1980s in New York, very different from California, where thanks to people like Alice Waters and Joyce Goldstein and Barbara Tropp um, and um, so many others, we had a much, much more French and Italian macho hierarchy, chef yelling at everybody. Most people were not women in the kitchen back in the 1980s. Most people were not women in the dining room in the 1980s. We always had that at Union Square Cafe. Our first sous chef at Union Square Cafe was a woman. I should mention that a month into opening Union Square Cafe, I couldn't find the chef anywhere until I opened the walk-in refrigerator and he was making out with the sous chef <laughs> in the walk-in refrigerator. Happily, they became spouses after that. You actually that. walked in on that. What I did walked... you do? Is that awkward? Like you said, excuse me, or, the fish um, is burning. Could you come back? I called my dad in St. Louis, and I said, what do I do now? Um, <laughs> and he said, you, you know, him? actually, he's, again, things haven't changed. He said, you get in an environment with, you've hired really nice people. And they're working hard, long hours together, and they're either going to fight or fall in love. And he said, as far as I'm concerned, falling in love is the better option. <laughs> but that's not, that doesn't get to your question about um, sexual harassment. I think that this is a good moment right now. It's painful for everybody. Every, you know, we, have, we have a number of restaurants. Jose has a number of restaurants. Aaron is getting there. Um, <laughs> You could and, stay small, which would be awesome too. And, so yeah. But and he's getting there. Yeah. What, what I was going to say is that uh, you know a lot of the people that you were writing about in in your piece today apparently did bad things. And did you they, know how bad it was, like with Mario, for example? I, I did not know we, that. Yeah. Um, but I, I also what I was going to say is that even if the the head people are not doing bad things, I can promise you that as human beings. Bad things have happened in our organization. You ask Aaron, I guarantee you things have happened in our organization. I'm aware of things now that I was not aware of until this movement. And so we're spending a lot of time in our restaurants learning about what has been going on. And Are you doing your active mail listening and you're learning like what's, I mean, has it been eye-opening for you guys? Or? Yeah, just one more thing. And yeah. I'm going to turn it over because he'll take his time, I promise you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> My but, English is not as good as yours. Yeah. <laughs> But, but what I was going to say is, <laughs> I do find it ironic that uh, in this moment, 
that you've got three white guys up here on stage. Well, that's because we wanted to get down to the problem, so we brought you guys up here. Okay. <laughs> the sisters all know what's going on. It's not that interesting to have them. Over. No, I'm kidding. But, um, but anyway, yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? And I think there's a, a movement to say, you know, people are like, how, how, you know, there's a call in the, the Twitter dump for uh, people to not support organizations that don't have more diversity in, you know, the San, the San Pellegrino Awards or, you know, I know you got a little bit of a hard time for your Cayman Island things that had uh, 10 chefs and I think, and one woman, uh, you 24 know, 24 chefs and one yeah, woman. Yeah, it was Eric Repair always does a big thing at, um, in the Cayman Islands, it's, it was your 10-year anniversary, and it looked fun. You jumped out of a helicopter under the water. I saw. Yeah, it looked fun. Um, so you know, and there is pressure. Like how and how can we think about you know even when we write stories, sourcing better, uh, not going to the expected people, not you know the heads of the industry. You know, you always want to get to the top, and the times we luckily have access to people. But how are we listening to people who aren't at the top? And so I think across the board. Um, you know, this is this is changing. Um, but do you think having women in the kitchen makes the difference, or is it is it? I mean, it's not the women's responsibility. Like we'll get some women in here and things will get better. That doesn't seem like the solution. Look, it, at Union Square Hospitality Group, um, we have women in the following positions: our our general counsel, our head of human resources, our chief culture officer, our head of purchasing and compliance, our head of marketing. Um, I'm missing about three, our CFO, mm -hmm. they're all women. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that we have not had incidents in the restaurant? Where, where you have women alone will not do it. It's basically creating an environment where you just have to say, as, as Aaron was saying earlier, if the primary belief is that our guests will never feel better treated than the people who work for us, it's just not it's not okay right. to make someone you work with not feel good. What do you do about the guests who sexually harass your staff, and certainly, you know, you know, have an image in our head of the, you know, big spending guy buying huge bottles of California Cabernet and wants that one waitress that they love, and it's a, you know, it's a transaction. I've waited tables, a little flirting. Well, I didn't give me that far, but it got, you know, I tried. And, uh, eliminate tipping is you know. a good start. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, so eliminating tipping is one way to. It's a good start because you, know. you eliminate the whole dynamic, which is. I know you'll let me do this because you know what I've got in for you in a couple hours. Mm -hmm. Just get rid of it. Right. Interesting. Okay. Jose, I had a very interesting last one. I did a time talk with, um, uh, with Anthony Bourdain a little bit ago when the Harvey Weinstein thing was just coming up. And I said, I'm, I was just going to fly down to spend time with you to report on you in Puerto Rico. And I said, I didn't know you that well. And I said, you know, and is he a good guy? Like, is he, what do you think of him? Is he, and she, he said, this guy's amazing. He said, when we all sit around the table and start talking about women, Jose will get up and leave. And he's like the most loyal guy to his wife that I've ever seen. He, you got very good, I don't know if that means anything. If Anthony Bourdain says you're not a sexist, I don't know what that means exactly. <laughs> so that's good. But, um, but anyway, how do you view it? Did you, did, talk, did you talk to your staff when all this was happening or did you find that you didn't need to? I'm sure we, we need to, I think. Uh... I think, as Danny said, it's an important moment. Uh, I think it's an important moment in history. If we think about it, uh, yes, it's true that if we think about America, if we think about Europe, and we take a look at the top kitchens, they seem that they are all run by men, where the chef is the man. But sometimes it's the short way to see it. And then, yes, we need to change that. But if you really take a look who is feeding humanity today, I can tell you that who has the, rep the responsibility on the shoulders to feed humanity, those are women. I can tell you I've seen it. If you go to Haiti, yes, in the restaurants maybe you have the, the top restaurant, maybe it's the boy running the kitchen. But across the island, who is feeding every Haitian is every single woman. We're talking about feeding, because it's a very important thing. Feeding, and then maintaining the human species alive. Women carry with them one, two of the most important weights of keep moving humanity forward. Well, we want more money then. <laughs> and I will agree with you. <laughs> yeah. So in this case, for me, it has changed as, as, a, as a man of really trying to understand who we are and how we are treating others, but especially how are we treating women. As a father of three daughters who I adore, 
and I want to make sure that they are going to have the future they deserve without having to fight for it. I'm a husband of a wife I adore, and I'm whatever I am is thanks to what she's given me and kept me always straight and making me understand what life is. Then as a leader of my company, and I agree with that. I mean, we are, uh, this is an awakening for everybody. And I do believe that, yes, we is non-negotiable that we need to take care of the lives of everybody, but especially women that seems they've been taken advantage of. And whatever we do is not going to be enough. So that this is happening, it's, it's a hard moment. I don't think it's a hard moment. It's the right moment. Has happened many times before in history that certain moments change uh, humanity because some people use a spoke and they said no more. And if this Me Too movement is now, the restaurant industry has to do the same as any other industry. But this is not about the restaurant industry and chefs and cooks. This is about humanity. This is about America. What America we want to have? Who are we as the people? Mm -hmm. We are only as good as the people we have around us. Mm -hmm. So yes, we need to be calling out if some people are not behaving in the way we should be behaving. It started at the very top. That's why for me it's so hard to believe that not too far away we have somebody that doesn't follow those same rules. That now we're going to be asking every every American, every person in the world to follow. So we need to be calling out when we see something that is not right. That's interesting. And chefs now we're all looking to you all to do some of that calling out in ways that wasn't, you know, true before. So now. Uh, and at James Beard Foundation, for example, has a politics boot camp where they teach chefs to go advocate in Congress for certain things. Um, you know, we care very much about your opinion about sexual harassment because that obviously affects your, your thing. But there are many other issues that we're looking to chefs uh, to be involved in. Tom Colicchio has lobbied for, uh, I mean, it's food related, but, uh, you know, for, for uh, changes to the Farm Bill. And he's made himself pretty comfortable uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, Aaron, are you, now as a, as a younger chef, no offense guys, but do you, I mean, are you like, okay, now I gotta cook this amazing food, I gotta deal with my staffing issues, I have to kind of deal with my own creative desires, run a business, and also have political stances on things. I mean, is it, do chefs all now have to have foundations and be involved? What do you think of the chef as political player these days? Um, well, first I don't feel that young, but uh, okay. I, I mean, it's tricky because, you know, we have a huge group of people that we work with, and on one end, <clears throat> I, I don't want to speak out for everybody as a company, and, you know, I, people in our company probably have very different views throughout, and, uh, I mean, many are on one side, there might be a few on another, so, like, I, I don't feel like, in some ways, I should speak out and represent those people for, you know, political views, necessarily, but for humanitarian type things, like, I feel comfortable speaking for our entire organization, for all the people who work with us. Uh, I mean, how, like, yeah, social change, having having some kind of impact there. I think that uh, us joining on to No Kid Hungry recently, um, inspired by these guys, it was was big. Uh, the World Food Program is some, uh, something that we're a part of that I'm, I'm really passionate Tell about. Tell me the World Food Program. Tell me a little bit. Uh, so the World Food Program is an organization that we donate to. Uh, so for every guest who dines at uh, Rose's Luxury, uh, we donate 25 cents to the World Food Program, which uh, feeds a hungry child a meal plus some take-home rations uh, when they when they go to school. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we're in the let's see, four years. We're roughly 200,000 meals at this point, and um, we've actually had it's great. We've actually had friends who were inspired by us to do <coughs> similar things. Uh, there's a restaurant in Brooklyn that's that's doing the same thing, and on their website it says inspired by Rose's lecture. Nice. So it's really it's a great feeling. Yeah. But um, you know, I, I think that speaking up is definitely a responsibility of anybody who's, who's weeding people on, in some way. But uh, I think it is important to realize, to understand the things that you sh can speak up for and should, and the other ones that you, know, you don't want to speak for other people's opinions. And, and Danny, you, you could probably run for office, I feel like. But um, uh, do you, how do you decide what, how you're going to use your voice in the political landscape? Do you, you have foundations and you give a lot of money away? How do you decide that? And do you try to stay neutral? Because you've got, you know, both people from all political persuasions love to eat your food. Food's pretty, you know. And, and may work for me as well. Yep, absolutely. So, so. Yeah, no, it's, it's something that I've um, felt very, very deeply for my entire career. I was a poli-sci major. 
spent the summer between freshman, excuse me, between my senior year in high school and freshman year in college working in the uh, Senate as an intern for the Missouri Senator Stuart Symington. And I, I love politics, and I love the fact that, thankfully, we are all restaurateurs at a time when what we do actually matters to people. It's not just, this is where I'm going out for my birthday, or this is where I'm going out for Valentine's Day. People are now, and have been for some time, making choices where they dine out based on a shared sense of values, not just on how amazing the food is. And I've been aware of that for a long time. I think early in my restaurant career, having chosen not to go the direction of law and politics, but rather to get into the restaurant business, the first easy step was supporting parks and the green, Union Square Green Market. And it became increasingly aware to me that our choices of who we were buying our food from and our, our wine from even was a political act because it was making a choice that we're putting out there commercially our values just on that line. Then I got involved with hunger relief. I went on the board of Share Our Strength in 1992. And I've been on the board ever since that point, and I'm one of the greatest experiences of my life. Uh, Share Our Strength, though, even, I would say, historically has towed the line and not been an incredibly controversial topic until very recently. Who in the world would say, I want there to be more hungry children in the world, or more hungry children in America? Until the last couple of years, or maybe the last year exactly, um, <laughs> That, that has not been a particularly political statement. Increasingly, what I'm finding, though, is that in this era where there's a lot of bottled up frustration, uh, that uh, we are actually being asked much more vociferously and consistently by our staff members, by our dining public, and by journalists. <coughs> to take a stand on things and to not sit on the sidelines. I think Jose has modeled this absolutely beautifully for the rest of us um, after you got into a very, very uh, important uh, stand-taking skirmish with uh, a restaurant you chose not to do, which I have so much respect for. And I think many chefs and restaurateurs are doing that. And, uh, do you, do you, now's don't you the time. lose customers, though? I mean, uh, if you have somebody who was a, a Trump supporter, or, or I mean, are you worried about alienating, you know, percentage of your customer base if you take that that stand? I know you don't give a shit, but <laughs> we can't use that word on Facebook. Oh, that's right. We can't use that Akeem, on Facebook. Akeem, I, I, well, I, apparently we can use it in the New York Times now. So, um, but yeah. but but we we I we give S H I T. Uh, well, let's talk about this. What may, did you think twice before you took on the president battling over? Uh, in, me personally, no. And I own my company. I, I control my company. Right. And for, let's just recap. For you now, were going to, until they kick me out. You were going to put a restaurant in the Trump Tower. He said some disparaging. Uh, in the old post office. In the office. old post office. was going to yep. be his new hotel. Uh, uh, he made some disparaging comments about uh, Mexican immigrants. Huh? And you s wanted to get out of the contract, right? And well, now, did you start speaking out before you well, got into the I legal? I didn't want to get out of the contract. I want him to have. You want him to apologize? I want him to have a speech that would be more logical, that they could have a conversation with my daughters, and they could agree with me the day they are older. I wanted to have a conversation with him to try to, sometimes you don't need to apologize, but yes, it's okay to change mm -hmm. your, your speech. And I spoke to him, and his speech didn't change. And at the end, it was not only my decision, but it was the decision of my board that they supported the, 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 the simple idea of we cannot be part of this. Uh, uh, I'm sure I give a shit. I, you only live once. And I want every one of you in this room. You can be Republican. I have plenty of very good, smart people, friends, who are men and women Republican, and I respect. And plenty of good, smart men and women who are Democrats, and I do respect. And when I bring them together in a table, we respect each other. Even when we come from different angles. In many things, I see myself as more right 
wing. In other things, I see myself as more left wing. At the end, it's not one better than the other. It's the two sides that help you use, have a logical conversation of what may be the best outcome for every single American and every single person in the world. So the decision I made was one that I, I am only going to live once, as far as I know. <laughs> and I want to make sure I am in that last second of my life. And I may be surrounded, hopefully, by people I love, and they love me back. And I don't want to have any regrets that I didn't do what I thought was the right thing. Today, uh, I think an hour ago, the Washington Post published an op-ed about supporting immigration reform, supporting DACA, supporting the people on temporary visas, especially Salvadorians and Haitians. Let me tell you, part of my success, part of the most that 30 restaurants I have in America is being on the shoulders of people from Salvador and people from Haiti and many other immigrants, as well as many other born Americans. I mean, just to be clear, this, I have to be speaking up. You wrote the editorial. You wrote the op-ed. Even that with got my uh, plenty of help, I have like 25 people. Because the English me. was very good. <laughs> the English was very good. But um, and it was in that. What's this? The whole, what is the local paper here? The oh, the Washington Post, right? Okay, so <laughs> uh, I forget. Um, but it was. But but they, you talked. They are to, hiring. Right, right. That's right. That's true. I mean, I've got I've got an interview in about I mean, a half hour. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, yeah. but you wrote about Mr. Besser, Jeff. <laughs> She's you, good. You wrote about um, uh, someone on your staff, and I think you you use the name uh, Manuel, right? Yep. But you wrote the, it's, it's, it's actually was a lovely um, a lovely opinion piece about this uh, fellow who works for you. Tell us a little bit about well him. One more person in America, but imagine a man that yes came to the states, I guess, uh, cross uh, undocumented through the border. But this is one of the big lies we have in America. We, we, we look to the other side, but we let the people in. Because if we don't let the people in, let's, let's not lie to ourselves. If you've not been there, I've been there. I've been there picking up okra with them in the okra season. And those people picking up our, drogas, uh, our okra so we can have a good jambalaya, many of them are undocumented. And we look to the other side. All of a sudden, when the okra season goes away, oops, immigration officers show up, and they kick them out. America is about pragmatism. We should be creating those smart visas that gives the opportunity to those people to come in, work, get paid, go back to their countries, make their communities better, and next year do the same. But we don't have this type of business. We make it very difficult for American business to succeed. That's why we have undocumented in America. Let's be clear. Without them, is many things would, wouldn't be happening. So this is one more man. Happens he's from Salvador. Yes, he came undocumented. And because in Salvador, it's a very hard time and it's civil war, his young child came. At the end, he got DACA and two of his children born in America. So here we have a father with a temporary visa, and then we have a child with DACA and two born children in America. So what can we do? We kick the father out and the young child out, and they go back to a life that has no future. And then we keep two American born children without family. It's, it's hard. What I'm only trying to say is let's be all more pragmatic. America, when I came first on, on the Spanish Navy ship, I saw the Statue of Liberty on Ellis Island. And yes, we should not be ever supporting anybody that does anything illegal. And crossing the border undocumented, I will not disagree with anybody that says this shouldn't be happening. I agree 100%. But what we cannot be doing is letting them in when we need them and kicking them out as the, if they are human garbage. Garbage. We need to be finding a more pragmatic way to make America keep growing, keep having an amazing economic growth and future, at the same time making sure that we respect every single man and woman that are helping us have the life we have. That's what I'm arguing. And you could be vice president when Danny runs for office. 
re the restaurant industry, and certainly I know my experience talking with a lot of farmers in South Georgia, I live in Atlanta now, that, uh, that, that we could really survive in the food business without um, undocumented workers. I'm, I mean, I'm sure that there are many in your kitchens, not that you would say that, but I would guess that I'm there are. I'm sure there are not in our kitchens. You're absolutely sure. I'm 99.99% .99 sure because we took this very, very seriously probably about eight years ago for the mm -hmm. first time. And I'm pretty darn sure that's the case. You have social security numbers for them all. And that's not even enough okay. because I know from my kids before they turn 21, it's easy to get a card. <laughs> the fake ID. Um, well, I, let's talk a little bit about um, the DC dining. You're about to come to this market in a big way, Danny, is that right? Union Square Cafe. Well, we opened um, several Shake Shacks here over right. the past several right. years, so it won't be the first time. Um, we are going to be at Capital Crossing. Mm -hmm. Not sure exactly when. Don't know if it'll be this year. Um, it's a massive project, but we're mm -hmm. very excited about it. Any advice, guys, that you want to give Danny here about the <laughs> DC market? The DC market's kind of a tough market in a way. Don't you Open think? soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I visit. I visit your restaurant the other day. Looks great. Happens I was in the area. I know the guys well. Yeah. And and having you there is going to be awesome. Thank you, Jose. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, what, what advice would you give him about, I mean, about dining in DC? I grew, I, my time spent training in New York, I grew up eating at uh, Gramercy Tavern like literally twice a week and often just for- How could I'd you afford for, that? Are you patronizing him? Literally yeah. spent all my money there. You don't need to. Yeah, yeah really. Actually, uh, you, don't have to you were best Nancy, restaurant Nancy, of America last year. Nancy Olson. <laughs> Nancy Olson was the reason I used to go hmm. all the time. Uh, just awesome dessert. pastry chef. Oh my God, unbelievable. But um, yeah, no, DC is actually, it's an amazing scene, it really is. I don't think that, you know, I worked working in New York, uh, there was a lot of problems that I experienced as a sous chef or as a cook of like the difficulties of the New York scene that, that are, that a lot of them don't exist here, which is really great. I mean, it's not, it's not like it's all, you know, super easy, but there's a lot of things, the, the dining public here is incredible. They're open to so much, they're excited about new things, they're, they're, um, really just like jazz to see what, what can be brought to the table. So it's a very uh, welcoming dining scene. So I, I honestly don't think there's a lot of advice to give. It's a great place right, to have a restaurant. Good. How about you, what do you? Um... I mean, it, quite frankly, to, to, give any, uh, to give any advice to Danny is like, <laughs> really? Well, whatever you give, whatever you give <laughs> I mean, me, I'm gonna return when you come to you, New York. You read, yeah. you read his book and then you wanna read it 10 more times because you know you're missing so much. So it's not, it's not much advice I can give him because I know he's gonna help make this city even better, um, even greater, which is such a good word. Uh, <laughs> English is um, tricky, tricky. But I'm gonna tell you this thing. Uh, sometimes I sense, especially, who, who from here is, feels Washingtonian? Who's a Washingtonian? Come on, my daughters, bring okay. up your hand. Are, they, is this, are these your daughters? Plenty of people, uh, I love it. Hi. Wave. So I am a Washingtonian, probably the Washingtonian with the biggest accent in the history of Washington. <laughs> I have the biggest accent there er, ever was, because that's the new way to be. You have to be bigger and bigger accent than anybody else. <laughs> and I do. And I'm not gonna lie to you, when I came here 25 years ago, and sometimes, especially with young chefs sometimes, and, I, and this happened to me when I was young. And, and they, oh, Washington was boring before, and, and sometimes touches your heart. Listen, when I came 25 years ago, this city was not boring. We had a great man called Jean-Louis Paladin, who was at the Watergate. And I don't speak highly of French chefs in the open. <laughs> <laughs> he made me feel welcome in a city that was new to me. We had Roberto Donna, kicking Italian cooking right, south, north, and east. We had Nora Puyon, with as much as I love Alice Waters, the queen of organic cooking right here in Washington, D.C. We had Patrick O'Connell 40 years ago having a restaurant in the heart of Virginia. He's gay, for God's sake, in the heart of Virginia, <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. You know how hard it is 40 years later to be one of the top restaurants? Mark Fustenberg, best bread ever. Oysters, Rappahannock, so many others in the Chesapeake Bay. Wine country, Virginia and Maryland. RDB, Linden, so many others. My God, every time I think about it, Mark Fustenberg, 
I keep thinking, thinking, Washington to me since I arrived in this city, and first I came to New York, and I learned so much, and I always tell my daughters, I've been very lucky that they came to New York, because for me it was a very good university. That's my daughter ended now at NYU instead of GW. Um, <laughs> In my alma mater, and she goes to NYU. Get my break. <laughs> She's just like DC. It's been only that we've been 600,000 people, and just Virginia and Maryland makes us a much bigger. But here, Ethiopian restaurants, Korean markets, Chinese restaurants all over. Washington DC, to me, I learned, offshore is one of the most fascinating cities to grow up as a chef or as a person that loves food. So for me, for us, just having the great Danny Mayer, not only with the Shake Shack, which, which we all love, uh, and he could only be the one to make a burger chain successful when there's so many burgers in America. He could only be the one. Um, it's, it's great the that he's going. It's sauce on the fries, I think. It's something, but I don't know what he has. He has a touch. That's why I want, I'm going to give myself some advice because I, th I think that. Um, but but he, he's going to do well, and we're so lucky that he's coming here. Thank, thank you. Thank you much. both for that. Um, I'm just going to say, uh, I, I know this well, and I know this because I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. And when I first moved to the East Coast, uh, there was a sense of arrogance that I got in New York. Um, New York Yankees, um, some other real estate people, and they, and you got a sense that everyone from New York thought that they were the last, you know, the last thing you ever needed to meet in your life. And I think that Union Square Cafe is not a brash, arrogant restaurant, but it is from New York. And so I think that one of the things that, that we've learned, and I think we've learned this from Shake Shack, is that People are not necessarily thrilled to hear New York is happening to them. Cities are proud. Uh, Philadelphia is proud. Boston is proud. Washington is proud. Chicago is proud. And so if the leading edge is move over, everybody, we're from New York, I think all bets are off. So I think that the thing that I'm most excited about whenever we get this, this place open is starting with the great restaurant community, the food community itself, because we sh one of the things that, I, that I'm really sad about, I, I agree with Jose, I think that the, the Me Too moment is so important. The conversations are changing. We are now mostly talking about problems, mostly, that happened before yesterday. But I think we have an amazing moment to talk about who we want to be going forward right now. And I think as long as people are afraid to talk about this because they're afraid of stories that may be skeletons in the closet from the past, we will not have the progress going forward. But what's really also sad is that this moment is obscuring amazing humanitarians that so many people in this industry are, men and women, both. This man just got done feeding two million people in What's Puerto your Rico. Count now, Jose? Did I? Did I? Three. Three point two million. Yeah, that's and an amazing operation. And that's before fires in Napa. Three point three. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's he's like MacGyver, but <laughs> he is. I have to say, I spent. I got to spend a few days. And but but I also want to say that that so is a huge number of colleagues in this industry. And so when we go to a new city like Washington, D.C., look how much we can learn. Look how much we can learn about local producers. Look how much we can learn about a new food scene. Look how much we can learn about a clientele that will be a very different clientele than the one we have in the Flatiron District. Right. It'll be interesting. And I, I wonder, is it, does D.C., does, you know, I don't want to go too deep back and open the Trump door here. I'm going a little bit. So is who in the White House, does it make a difference? Like it felt so vibrant when the Obamas, because they were a, a family that liked to eat out at restaurants. Um, if you don't have a restaurant person in, in that top office in D.C., does it affect the, the tone of D.C. restaurants or does it matter one way or the other? Um, it's really, or is it more just about do people have money to spend at restaurants? I mean, honestly, for us, we haven't really noticed any difference between <clears throat> the current administration and Obama mm -hmm. administration. Um, I mean, we've felt the scene change, but I don't, I don't think it's due to who's in the White House. 
I mean, it's been an unbelievable How has the amount. scene changed, in your opinion? I, I mean, there's so many, not just quantity. I, there's obviously a, t a lot more restaurants, but there's so much more quality and creative, unusual types of restaurants. Like, what mm. are, I mean, Which is happening around the country. I mean, yeah, yeah. Every I mean, city it's you go everywhere. to is fascinating. And, so. and uh, no different here. And there's just so many young, creative um, people who are willing to take risks and challenges and do different things, whether it's a tiny Filipino restaurant or, you know, all mm -hmm. Northern Thai, which I went to my birthday the other day. It was awesome. Right. Nice. Um, Where'd you but, go? Uh, Little Sarah. That's what okay. I'm we're going to try to get some recommendations out of them, too, before uh, we're done. But I, but I don't think it's changed at all because of that. I think I think it's changed on its own and for the positive. And um, I mean, it's it's super it was super exciting to have uh, the Obamas in our city eating out. I mean, it's like it was it was amazing. But yeah. Uh, yeah. right. I mean, yeah. But, Celebrities you know, are funny. But, but you said, I mean, I've been here uh, now 25 years. Uh, and for me, use every time that was welcoming new people in the town was very, very mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. I will say from Republicans a, or Democrats. But I will say from afar, um, I, and you, you would know way better than I would, but it seemed that the eight years that the Obamas were here do seem to correlate to an amazing restaurant boom in D.C. I'm, I'm not, not sure you can link those. Maybe it was just coincidence. It could have been complete coincidence. It absolutely could I have mean, been. I mean, Obama did a lot of things, but can we, can we credit him with the, like, revolution in restaurants in the last year? I don't know. <laughs> just saying. Hashtag suspicious, but okay. <laughs> um, well, Washington is, is, yeah. is, is in, I mean, Washington is more than politics now. Right, right. We this have, is true. Yeah. Man, we have Steve Case here, the founder of American Online. Give me a break. Right. <laughs> Ted Leonsis, the co-founder of American Online, the owner of The Wizard. We have so many amazing business people beyond politics. Right. But Obama has yeah. had his importance, I don't obviously. Think, I just don't think it hurt that, that they went out no, so didn't. often. That they went out to eat. And it no. was constantly covered in the press. No, it, and I it, think that attracted a lot more people it, to want to open up. Obviously, it didn't. But just two people going out every day doesn't. I mean, let me tell you who are the people that made this city cool. Well, you know and what? I, I think if, if you would lose your accent, we could reverse the ticket order. Yeah. Right. But let me tell you what I saw the change. The change was that when I moved here 25 years ago, the state where the president was from, you'll see a lot of Texas, a lot of Arkansas, a lot of mm -hmm. Illinois, and now you don't see anything. Before, you would see from the state the president came from, you see a lot of, of those tags around. It was very obvious that they moved in because they were joining the administration. Uh, I didn't see much in this one. Can I ask you just as a side thing, when I, do you want to have the, uh, the president at your restaurant or is, the social, or is the secret service and the vetting and the headache for all the other diners more headache than it's worth? I mean, I imagine that it's like, oh my God, not, I mean, how, how early do they come if you're having a president in your restaurant? It's top secret. <laughs> but this is just, this is this just is us. Different. That's why they keep us. coming back. Just I, off the record. It's Facebook. You, you know, Facebook, the Russians are watching. That's right. <laughs> Fake news. What do you want me now? And, right. and I have good friends from Russia. It has nothing to do. We're going to tell you all the secrets about searching a restaurant before a president comes in. Um, but is it, is it a pain in the butt? You've, have you had the Obamas at your restaurant? You haven't um, had the Trumps, I'm assuming. We have not. I've okay. heard. I've heard. Not yet. Ivanka likes to eat out, though, right? Yeah. Isn't that true? Okay. I've heard mixed things. She can't get in. That's why I, she's. I, in, yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, I've heard mixed things. Some people have had them show. I've heard stories about uh, uh, presidents or anyone from their cabinet showing up and uh, like five minutes before and you have no idea. Mm. Um, but sometimes I've also heard the other end where they give you like right. a day's notice. So. All right. So, so let's talk now. You are Can brave. Can I just tell you a quick story? Yeah, yeah please. This, this was great. Um, the Obamas both ate at, at Shake Shack here in Washington. And I'm pretty sure that won't happen again because mm. there's a preferred brand when it comes right. to burgers. Right. But, but you know, you can always dream. It would happen again. It, it would be okay. So open but, in Chicago, man. But Send I some Shake Shack to the White House. I do have a, a story at, at Mayalino in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, I got a call at um, actually an email at about five o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday um, from the, the then White House chef, Sam Cass. Mm -hmm. 
And he said, call me immediately. So why not? I called Sam, and he said, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is I'm off tonight. The bad news is you're not. <laughs> and this was at 5 PM. Oh, my gosh. The Obamas were going to be coming in for a 6 PM pre-theater dinner. And I had some appointment, and there was no way I could possibly get there, even breaking another appointment until 6.30. But it didn't matter. The, the phone call said, by the way, you should know that every Friday night, the president likes a good steak. And I'm going, we don't have steak on the menu at Myelino. And by the way, top secret, can't tell anybody. So I told the general manager at, at uh, Union Square Cafe, I said, you still have that steak for two, don't you? Yep. I said, just get one to the front door of Myelino in 30 minutes, no questions asked. We had the steak. Also on Friday night, the president likes one martini. It's his one drink all week. And the thing you need to know is that it's, it's, uh, it's not shaken. And so my advice to you is get your best two bottles of vodka in the freezer immediately, unopened, or the Secret Service won't let them have it, <laughs> and make sure they get out on time for the theater. Got it all. But no pressure. No pressure. So <laughs> I try to get into the restaurant at 630. I cannot even get through Gramercy Park because there are snipers in the park. Unbelievable. And the, pol the New York police would not let me even a block through really? to the restaurant. And finally, one of our regular guests tells the police, he really is who he says he is. Um, Don't you know who I am? No, <laughs> th they didn't know and they didn't really care. But I finally, I finally talked my way into my own restaurant. And I'm just kind of at the bar. The place is full. You have to be frisked on the way in. You've had this experience, right? And um, I'm, like, too nervous to go say hello to the president at this point. And finally, a Secret Service guy comes up to me. I'm just kind of like a little 18-year-old boy at the bar, my restaurant. And the Secret Service says, the president wants to see you right now. So I said, really? This is good. <laughs> So tell him to wait just a minute. I walk, I walk back to, uh, to the table, and he stands up and puts his arm around me. The entire restaurant goes <laughs> watching like that, and I'm going, Mr. President, how are you? Very. And he said some of the nicest things at that moment. He had been well prepped for everything. And now all of a sudden, it's... Um, it's 7.20, and I had made our staff promise to have the check down. By the way, who do you give the check to? That's that a good hour. question. Who do you give the check to? Well, I was you like, you like to tell the whole story. I, I mean, I don't tell any. So. It's illegal to tell the story. So you can be. <laughs> you like, can be subpoenaed. I mean, you from anything no. before, Jose. You can't, yeah. you can't I mean, get. I'm not tell you. No, no. In retrospect, you're fine. You can't talk about not it. Not an NDA. Yeah. You can't talk about it in prospect. But. 7.20, the check is down perfectly. They're still sitting at 7.30. They're still sitting at 7.40. They're still sitting at 7.45. They've got tickets to Raisin in the Sun. And I'm going to the Secret Service. We can't let the president miss the play. And the Secret Service guy says, you really think they're going to miss the play? <laughs> All right. They had a four-minute drive to get oh, to Broadway because right. every Cause street is completely blocked off. <laughs> exactly. And Amazing. they said the president has to be the last one in. Really? Right. I never knew that before. Why is that, do you suppose? Think about it. Well, I guess the whole Abraham Lincoln thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got that. Um, okay, so we are going to take your questions. So I want everybody to be thinking of one. And I think we may also take a few questions from our Facebook audience if they haven't gone to Netflix or fall asleep on the couch. Um, but I, you, you are both bringing new, you have both have high concepts and you have low concepts, right? So you have a, um, you know, the, the sort of fast casual, is that we're calling it now? Um, is it harder to execute a great meal, and I'll ask both of you this, at Minibar and say Union Square, or to execute a great meal at Shake Shack or Beef Steak? And you can start, Jose. What is a more difficult place to execute a, a good meal? Um, both the same. Really? It's the same, it's the same thing? You're not on Probably the beef steak will be even harder. Why in so is that? In so many ways. Well, because... You guys uh, eat a beef steak? Yeah. Is, yeah, you can. 
And we are still uh, working on that concept. We have six. We're opening three, four more this year. The dream of bringing vegetables to everybody, it's, it's I hope uh, we, we will be able to make it happen. And if it's not us, I hope we will be inspiring others to keep doing it. But to me, it's not any different. To me, to do a three, $400 meal per person versus to try to do a bowl of uh, six, seven, eight dollars per person, it takes the same effort. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes the same love. You, you don't put less love or less effort in one or the other. Mm -hmm. It's only two different, two different concepts. Danny, what about you? Well, I think the challenges are very different. From a cost standpoint, once you figure it out, you can actually, in the fast, we call it fine casual, because it's kind of a mishmash of. I can't keep up, but OK, fine. I call it fine casual. No, you are fine casual? I call it fine casual because it's the same ingredients we use in our mm -hmm. fine dining restaurants, the same kind of design, same way we hire for hospitality quotient. And I, I think that, that the, um, the, the thing that's easier about that is that if you want to give amazing dining value to your guests, you have kind of broken the old uh, rule of two, which fast food perfected, which is three, there's only three salient issues, speed, cost, and quality. And as any architect or contractor will tell you, or fast food told you, you can pick any two of those. Which two do you want? Fast food said, all right, got it. You want the speed and you want the cost savings. Obviously, for your $1, you're not going to get amazing beef that was raised humanely, on and on and on. So what Fine Casual is doing, and I think beefsteak is a great example. The, by the way, I, the breakfast I had at Pineapple and Pearls was a good example of this as well is to basically say, it's still the rule of two, but whoever wrote the rule, that it has to be one plus one plus zero. And so in our world, what we're able to do is to say, we're going to give you, um, you're probably going to pay 20% for the same quality food. You're not going to get 100% of the savings. You're probably going to save 60% of the time, and you're probably going to save um, 60% of, of, what did I say, the price? The, of, mm -hmm. So the bottom line is that if you give 0.65% of the quality, 0.65% of the time savings, and 0.65% um, of, of the value, et cetera, you still add up to two. And that part's great because we can give bite for bite. This, your, your culinary techniques at that lower price point are exactly the same. Why can we do it? Because we're not giving you a reservation, so we're not paying reservationists. We're not paying a host or a maitre d'. We're not paying a chef or a sous chef or a pastry chef or a sommelier or a florist or a linen company. That stuff starts to add up to a lot, or a bartender yep. or waiters and waitresses. And so if we can pass that savings on and you get all that quality, Mm -hmm. That's good. The hard thing about it is scaling hospitality. Mm -hmm. uh, you can scale systems, but learning how to scale hospitality so that if you go to a Shake Shack in St. Louis, Missouri, or in London, or in Los Angeles, it feels better than whatever place is next door to it, that's the bigger challenge. Well, you're going to have your work cut out for you because In-N-Out does that pretty well in California. So he's expanding Shake Shack to California, and we'll see if you can take on. Well, we've actually been there now for the three years, out. and it's doing great. Right. Okay. Well, there you go. Um, Aaron, I'm going to, this is. Um, you already open in California? Los Angeles and uh, San Diego. I we don't keep up. With we it. don't keep up. Yeah, I can't keep up. There's actually just opened a Shake Shack back in the green room. It's fantastic. We invite you all. They're popping up everywhere. Um, Judith Williams. Hello, Judith. Are you in your jammies out there on Facebook? Um, and Aaron, I'll ask you this. What, what will it take for us to start recognizing, and these are quotes, ethnic food as, as haute cuisine or as more elevated? Um, and I think this gets at that thing where, and you know, newspaper industry was notorious for our cheap eat guides, which were basically all the noodle shops that we could find that we like. So, how, are we at a place where we're we're looking at different what we used to call ethnic cuisines, and can they be uh, elevated uh, in some way? Yeah, I mean, I I think it's already happening a lot, especially I mean, in, in New York you see it a lot. Um, 
<clears throat> I was just reading about a restaurant. It's that new Chinese Peking duck. Uh, was, that's the literally dog, the one I was Which is very good, yeah. by the way. Um, but no, there, and there's a bunch of uh, uh, super high-end Korean restaurants in, in New York that are actually on my to-do list once I can get a break. But, um, but yeah, I think it's already there. I think you're, there's a lot of food that's not, you know, quote, unquote, American that is uh, being elevated to really high levels, or French, or Spanish, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I, it's totally happening, It's and right. hopefully, you know, see more of it. But um, yeah, I think we're already, I mean, I think yeah. we're already there. Yeah. In America, ethnic cuisine began in 1492, really, when the Spaniards <laughs> came. <laughs> and we joined what well, the, comes back the, the Indians Spaniards. here were making. In the 1600s, we got the Japanese coming to visit Philip II. And that's the restaurant I was going to open in the old post office. A Spanish Japanese restaurant. What the samurai, what the Spain will be today if the samurais knew how to cook. <laughs> but long Very story short, if you think about it, uh, about this thing of ethnic, if you are from the East Coast and you've never been to California, anything that comes from there to the East Coast technically is ethnic cuisine. <laughs> Because tell me a guy from New York what has to do with somebody from California, nothing. And Alaska and Florida, give me a break. So yes, ethnic seems to be anything that looks foreigner and you cannot pronounce, or if you pronounce it, you look funny. But the truth is that one of the things that makes America the most amazing country on the history of mankind is that not other country in the world that you will find every single ethnic cooking in many of the cities across America. At the end of the day, food is what is gonna save America. Because once, once we realize how welcoming America has been with every single foreign flavor, with every single foreign ingredient, foreign technique, and America made it its own, and when now you find more ramen places than anywhere in Japan, and more types of ramen than anywhere in the world, there you realize that America really has embraced diversity like no other country in the history of mankind. And I'm Jose Andres, and I endorse this message. That's why America is great. Um, if people want to come up, there's a microphone, and is there anybody who wants to ask a question? Uh, don't be shy. Don't be, don't be afraid, even if you have an accent. The guy, are the crutches real or is that just a prop to be first in line? Both. Real? Okay. Oh, very nice. Uh, Daniel Kramer from Duke's Grocery. Um, I had a question. Uh, Who are you from? I'm sorry? Uh, Duke's Grocery. We have a okay. couple of restaurants in Thank town. Thank you. Um, oh, people chef, love you. That's right. Chef, you, you touched on the, uh, that diners are becoming more acceptive and more adventurous of world cuisines. Uh, you know, you mentioned our neighbor, which is amazing, Northern Thai, and, and so much more. It also seems that as they become uh, more adventurous, also more particular and more sensitive to dietary needs, gluten-free, pescatarian, peanut allergies of all kinds, um, how are you adjusting uh, to those new um, requirements that guests are, are putting on you guys? Yeah, Thanks. what do you do about the gluten-free, raw, vegan? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and how many of those do you get a night? A lot. A lot. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I love Duke's grocery. Thank you. I go there like a lot. It's awesome. Okay. Um, but no, we, we adapt uh, very well. I mean, even Pineapple and Pearls, which is uh, about a 12 course menu. I mean, we can, we very easily do a 12 course vegan menu for anyone who's vegan or a vegan gl gluten free, dairy free menu. Mm -hmm. um, the chefs who work there uh, are incredible and I mean, we anything that anything that anybody has a restriction to, like we will um, be accepting of and do, do it. Do you enjoy that as a challenge, or are you like? Oh. No, it's actually awesome. We really we really get excited about cooking vegan food, believe it or not. Right. And uh, I, that you know that's a pineapple and pearls at roses. We have we're super accepting of of every um, allergy and, and restriction. And then at our new place, which just opened up a couple weeks ago, we're doing you know French toast and cinnamon toast that are gluten-free and we're doing dairy-free options. I mean, we've got every, everything we possibly can. And it, it actually feels, I mean, it feels good to be able to say yes to people. Yeah. So when someone's like, I can't have this, I can't have that, it actually like, it feels good to be able to say yes because we're, we're just trying to make people happy. So it's not, I mean, growing up as a cook, like I, oh. I remember being like, oh God, like peanut allergy, like damn, this sucks. But like, mm -hmm. it's changed now. Now I'm no longer in just the business of, you know, 
cooking fish on a station. I'm now in the business of making people happy. So it's, it's very enjoyable. And uh, all of our chefs, like, honestly really enjoy it and kind of champion it. So yeah, Beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Kylie McGinney. I have a blog, Mission Michelin. I'm curious what you, you think. Have a I'm sorry, you have a blog? Yeah, Mission Michelin. I'm eating my way through the DC Michelin Guide. Are and you really? Yeah. Well, mazel tov. Thank wow. you. <laughs> so I'm curious what you guys think the impact of the Michelin Guide has had in both of your cities since it's in both now. So are we for the Michelin Guide or against it? Have you seen any changes since it's been introduced? What do you think? Listen, I, I was a very young boy when I used to go around restaurants in Barcelona. Um, waiting for somebody to open the door of a one, two Michelin restaurant. I only wanted to have a second to have a glimpse of what was happening inside, because I couldn't afford, my family couldn't afford to go. We tried to go around in the back to try to get a glimpse of what was going on in the kitchen. I would love those restaurants that would have the menu outside, and you could read the menu, and for a second dream that you were eating that menu. So I'm not going to lie to you if I, I don't tell you since I was uh, probably 16 that I worked in my first two-star Michelin restaurant. And those two stars had a lot of weight. You will tell your friends, I work in a two-star Michelin restaurant. So when um, I moved to open in LA, one of the great things to open Bazaar in the SLS Hotel in LA was that it was Michelin in LA. And when we are about six months about to open, the press release of Michelin goes and says, we're not going to do the Michelin Guide in LA anymore. And I'm like, <laughs> shut. And I'm about to open in Vegas. And I was opening this small restaurant, Eight Seeds, E. And Michelin was there. And when we are one year about to open, Michelin announces that they are not going to do the Michelin Guide anymore <laughs> in Las Vegas. And then I look at the sky, and I'm like, really? <laughs> and then when they announced they were opening here, then was all the contrary. I'm like, yes. But then it's like, do we deserve anything? So you know, for me, uh, uh, quite frankly, at this point, I'm 48. Uh, I'm still young, but I'm not a millennial in the sense anymore, even I, I try. But, but for me, it meant a lot. But it meant more because my team, it meant a lot to them. Yeah. And everybody in the entire company got kind of, you know, wow, we got two stars. Why? Because at the end, what we do a mini bar uh, is not much different than what we do a Haleo, Sitina, and Oyamel. We all kind of fit from each other in so many ways. So for me, it was special because the team were thrilled. I'm not going to lie to you. My little heart, 48 year old, I'm like, good, now I can close it. <laughs> uh, but we never did it because the Michelin, or we never did it because the stars. So we did it for our own. We wanted to do the best food we could. So when I opened Mini Bar 15 years ago, 16 years ago, was I want to please myself, I want to please the team, I want to please our friends, and then the people will, will come to join it. So it, it meant a lot. It, it, for me, it's like, check, next. Uh, do you, does, what do you think uh, the impact of Michelin is on, for you all as, as chefs? Does that matter? I mean, obviously, it's nice to get that. It means a lot to business, but what do you think? I mean, um, is, it, is it? I mean, it's, it's super exciting, that's for sure. I, I think the year before they came to DC, I was like, yeah, Michelin's never going to DC. I, they're, they're always going to be in New York. And um, so it was, it was really exciting. But I think, honestly, yeah, kind of like Jose said, the, the best part about it is those stars belong to your staff. And it's just another, you know, we give our staff a lot of positive feedback, and it's great that they hear that from us. But to be able to be recognized by, you know, a, a pretty legitimate outside source is awesome. And, and as soon as we got those stars, as, uh, myself and the entire leadership team, um, we, you know, we thanked, we told the staff those belong to them. And that's like the best part to see. Yeah, it's, it's so rewarding to, to have them be successful. And so, yeah. yeah. But, but then the other day, I don't know what happened in what country in Europe, that they published the guide and they had to have a press release because they gave one star to a top left place without food. Oh, that's right, the guy who started the garage. So a top left place got a one star Michelin and they don't top even serve food. No, top less. Oh, top less. <laughs> <laughs> and top less is the good word to imagine. <laughs> right. But anyway, that's. But that happened. But anyway, we are very proud. Does that, does that help your? Great, thank you. So keep up doing your work. Yeah, it's very interesting. What's, it, what's your blog again so people can follow it? 
Mission Michelin. So my mission, mission is to eat my way through the Michelin gotcha. Guide. Okay. Keep it up. Okay. Hashtag. And be now. nice to us. <laughs> Aaron, can you discuss your decision to make Rose's a non-reservation restaurant and talk about kind of that trend? Yeah, this is an interesting one because it's, I, I was going to eat at your restaurant last night and I got stuck in Atlanta and I'd already bought the ticket. It was like, it was like I had tickets to Lady Gaga great. and I couldn't go. It so you were going to his restaurant, you were not going to mine, great. Honey, <laughs> oh, I just screwed up. Boom. <laughs> But I've eaten at your yeah. restaurants. Oh, yeah. New York Times had the piece in Washington. Yeah, yeah, okay. Hours. I'm okay. Show's over. That's it. I'm gonna... <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, that's a weird thing. So this is this new thing, and you go on, and you can reserve, and uh, you get tickets. And it's not reservations, really. You sort of buy a ticket, essentially, to your restaurant. Tell us about your decision to do it that way, and how's that working out? Um, well, I think that's two different. So there's two different things here. One is uh, Pineapple and Pearls, which you're talking about, which is a ticketed uh, ticket event. So, you, you know, you buy a ticket for like a sporting event or going to a show and it includes everything and you know it's more than something you plan weeks out and it's it's more than just dinner it's it's an experience it's entertainment for the evening um, I think what the question was about was roses and not taking reservations right, right. which um, you it's know I live both in, ends of the spectrum really yeah yeah and uh, they're very different <laughs> but uh, I live in the neighborhood and I lived in the neighborhood uh, Capitol Hill before I found the building that roses is in and so I really wanted it to be a neighborhood place. And one of the things that was really important to us, and I mean, is in our mission statement, is, is making sure it's the most enjoyable restaurant to, to dine in. And one of the things that we thought really took away from that was if you had to tell a guest or ask a guest to get up and leave because you needed their table back. And I mean, there was a lot of, there was a lot of reasons why we decided not to do reservations, but that was, that was a big part of it. And we really just wanted to show people the best time possible and didn't care how long they stayed and didn't want to tell anyone they had to go. And I'd say that was probably one of the biggest reasons that we decided not to. Are you going to keep it that way? So we, I mean, we're still operating that same way. For larger groups, we have decided to take reservations because Make, you know, it, it's harder to get a group of six to eight people, and if you show up and then you can't get in, it's, you know, it, it, it's a little more hospitable to take uh, reservations for a large group. So it's almost right. like mini parties, but yeah, I mean, that's how we operate now, and we have never once had to ask a guest, like, they, I mean, we've had guests stay five, six, maybe even more hours than that, and, mm -hmm. and great. Like, yeah. let them have but, a great time. But probably it will change. Right. 25 years ago, Haleo, we didn't take reservations. And we didn't take reservations, there was nobody there. <laughs> <laughs> they, we will have people selling a white powder <laughs> across the street 25 years ago. To be or not to be, Shakespeare was next to us. Uh, we took reservations then, then we took half of the restaurant reservations and not. Why we were doing all of that? Because we were trying to be as good as we could with our guests, but then maximizing the capacity of the restaurant. So what you learn is that you keep adapting. You know, uh, it's a, uh, his restaurant is a heck of a good restaurant. Uh, and, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but I went there to, for you to understand how hard it was to get into his place. It's still the 20th year's anniversary with my wife. I don't go often places. It made me wait two hours and a half. No. <laughs> he didn't know. Yeah. I went in, I went out, the meal was great. We were able to spend time in Capitol Hill. How many of you have been to Capitol Hill? Yeah. Great. So if you want to understand the value of a restaurant creating community anywhere in any city in America, I think I learned it from Patrick Monaghan, who he said to me almost 25 years ago, we say a restaurant can make a neighborhood. I know Haleo helped make a neighborhood. I know his restaurant helped make a neighborhood. And Danny helped make a neighborhood. Many restaurants today, they help make neighborhoods with help of people like you. Right. Let's get a couple more in. I think we have time. Thanks for waiting. Hi, my name is Sandra Nyanchaka. I started a multimedia company called Hakuna Matata, where I mm -hmm. cover um, travel, culture, health, and fitness. I'd like to know what are some of your favorite dishes and also what are some interesting dishes that you've had from different countries that you've been to? Any, any new dishes in, of different countries you've been to? Anything yeah. coming top of mind? Uh, I remember one uh, in uh, Ivory Coast. I was 17th, 18th in the Spanish Navy. I went to Abidjan and I had a dish called Kedjenu. And they sent me right into a place outside Abidjan. And they told me that this woman, they made this amazing chicken and the chickens were all around it. And when I ordered the chicken, she told me it'd be three hours. 
and I understood why it took three hours because then I saw all the kids running around the kitchen chickens. <laughs> and used to watch the woman prepare the dish, to me it was life changing. So I still remember that dish because to me it was the first dish I ever had outside uh, Europe, outside of Spain and France. No, for me it was unbelievable. Right. Did anyone come to top of mind? I think the trip that I took last year for the first time to Seoul was probably the biggest eye-opener food-wise I'd had in a long time. I've been lucky enough to eat in, in uh, Japan quite a bit, but the food in Korea is exquisite. And the interest that people take in food and in restaurants and the profession um, and the real craft of, of cooking good food and hospitality blew my mind. And almost every single thing I ate was a, was a flavor I just had not had before. Is there one I, bite you can really remember? Uh, well, not one that's going to excite you, but the best fried chicken I think I've had in right. my life. Right. Aaron, how about you? Uh, I'm kind of I'm kind of tied between two things. One is uh, I mean they were both in Japan. Um, one that was my most recent trip. One was uh, fresh fresh made tofu like table side at in in Kyoto. It was just mind blowing and uh, a single bite that I still to this day like cannot get out of my memory is um, a piece of fish. It was a sushi, sushi shop in the bottom of an office building for uh, a restaurant that was pretty, well un, like, pretty unknown at the time. Um, I went there and had a, a bite of uh, what's called black-throated perch. And it was... Black-throated uh, perch? Yeah, yeah. And it was... That meal was the best meal of my life to date. And then I went back a year later and I had exactly the same best meal of my life to Great. date. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have, I think we have about five minutes, but we could probably get both your questions in. I'll I'm try, excited. I'll try and be quick. I'm Emily. I'm a native Washingtonian, a former Share Strength employee and a Capitol Hill resident. So thank you for making Capitol Hill so great. Um, I'm going to try and steal your job for a second here. New York Times enticed us by hearing about the future of restaurants. So I would love to hear real quick what you guys see ahead and what you're most excited about. Like, yeah, what's exciting? What's around the corner? Future, the democratization of dining still happening? What do you think? What do you see on the horizon? Your prediction? Oh, uh, uh, future of food, I see that um, we will have, I'm gonna give you one crazy one, that supermarkets across the world, we start with America, they're gonna have uh, the hydroponics farms next to them so for the salads, for example, we will not have to travel more than uh, 50 meters to bring you the salad from where it's produced to the place that you are able to buy it. This is gonna be happening before we know it. Okay, Danny? I think we're already seeing part of it, and that is as, as exciting as that last question was about what's the most exotic thing that you've eaten when you've traveled. That's one school, for sure, but I also think that Preparing food you know better than you knew it could be is a really, really important thing right now. And I, and I love this moment because it could be a bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich, but how good could it be if you really thought differently about the bacon or the egg or who made the bread mm -hmm. and how is it all put together? And for who's, the home cook and for the restaurant cook? Everybody. I think everybody right. uh, who cares about the quality of sourcing and preparation is now as ex at least as excited about how hard it is actually to make the best apple pie you've ever had in your life as opposed to some whiz-bang dessert that challenges your imagination. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Aaron. Um, I guess I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record here, but it's less of a prediction, but I, more of a hope. I think that um, it, there's more and more people that are starting to treat their own restaurants and operations not like, a, not like the way restaurants traditionally are and more just like really well-run businesses who care about their employees and take care of their staff and take care of everybody who walks through the building. And I, and I, I, I wanna think that's a prediction and it's, I so, guess- So restaurants well. is more holistic workplaces and community members. Yeah, and that just, Perfect. places that just happen to serve food. And yeah. they're, you know, community yeah. people that- That's beautiful, I hope you're absolutely right. Okay, take us home, my yeah. sister. It actually has something to do with a little bit of what we were just talking about, futures of restaurants. Um, part of, I'm part of Metropolitan Hospitality Group, which is a growing restaurant group um, in the area. And our biggest concern is staffing um, for growth. And I'm sure that all of you think about that whenever you're thinking about coming into the area and, and growing in this area. So what is your kind of ideas? How do you think you're gonna overcome that look of staffing? Because we do have so many quality restaurants here. 
Oh, so staffing. What's yeah. the staffing crisis in the restaurant business? Exactly, yeah. What are you How guys do you doing about that? that? I'll tell you what we're thinking about right now, not only for Washington, but everywhere, mm -hmm. which is that if you have a heart for hospitality or what we call a hospitality quotient, if you've got the right emotional skills, then it, what we need to start doing, all of us, better than ever, is breaking down the stereotypes of who typically gets those jobs mm -hmm. and where do they come from. And we are holding job fairs right now with organizations that we were not thinking about five years ago, For example. 10 years ago. So instead of just going to Cornell and Penn State and New York University and you know the French Culinary Institute, we are going to uh, organizations that are helping former prisoners, that are helping people with learning disabilities, that are helping people um, who, who may be older than me. And, and saying, if you've got a heart for hospitality, we want to hire you. And we will be a better industry by having more people around the table who don't look like me. And do you think we stop, if you change tipping and you, uh, t you, yeah. you charge more and you get rid of tipping, that you'll be able to actually provide better pay for people and better we benefits? We will provide better pay. We will provide a much more professional opportunity for people to grow their careers. And, and the other thing we didn't talk about, the elimination of tipping, we completely, um, we completely take a profession that has been based on the only way you get a raise is because you have to work Friday and Saturday night. And if you're a single mom, you don't get to be with your kids on the weekend if you want to make enough money. That all comes off the table when you eliminate tipping. So will tipping, real quick, our last, will tipping go away? Yes or no? Do you want it to go away? Um, yes or no? Um, eventually, yes. Okay. But, uh, the only thing uh, I agree uh, with Danny uh, Hart, we spoke about this before. The only thing I disagree with him is in how we will make that happen. He's a leader and he's making it from bottom to top. I do believe we should do it from top to bottom. I think it's something like Congress should make. Equal for everybody. So all the restaurant industry changes the tipping policy all at once. I see. So no certain restaurants benefit because they can because we can still fill them up with our employees and with the customers, but other restaurants will suffer. Right. So I support him, but I want to do it at the okay, top. I'm going at the top, immigration reform. We are 4% unemployment. This is the closest thing to total employment. We need to make sure that America, Republicans and Democrats, once and for all, pass comprehensive immigration reform. So America will have the employees that need to keep growing. Okay. That's mandatory. Thank you all. This has been amazing. Thank you, panel.